Hello and welcome to Eccentric Earth, the podcast where I, your host Amy Walker, delve into stories from across history with a guest who has no idea what the topic is going to be. Joining me this week is Dave Bond. Good evening, folks. Hi, welcome back, Dave. Yeah, what episode number is this? This is 28. So I've arrived 172 episodes early. <laughs> yeah, we just... I, I couldn't bear to have you away for that long, if I'm being honest. <laughs> I had to have you back again. <laughs> well, I've got to address it online. And sorry to our listeners here. I've, I've got to address this. Um, I'm a bit concerned I might be broadcasting with a transphobe tonight. <laughs> now, you, you don't know our struggle. Yeah. I, I'm awful for my views that people should be treated equally and have rights. Equally? Like, no. <laughs> Sorry, that's right. I forgot. It's not being treated equal, is it? There's a finite amount of rights, and giving one group more rights takes it from other groups. That's the way it works. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, yeah, I was shocked to read that, but I'll get over it. Yeah. If it makes you feel any better, I'll try and keep the transphobia down this episode for you. Dial it down. It's not appropriate. Yeah, it is. I just can't help myself. Mm. I see a vulnerable group and I have to kick it, you know. Mm, well, I'll keep you in line. <laughs> You'll keep me in line. Okay, that is honestly a sentence I didn't think I'd hear from yourself. Uh- <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> oh, So... I have a topic for you this week, which you may know about. Really? Okay. Yeah, um, because you're into your films and movies. Um, So it may be someone, I say it may be someone you know about. You'll know the name. A lot of people know the name. But I found that there's quite a bit of their life that not many people actually seem to know about. So I'm going to take a punt that this is going to be a story you won't know everything about. That's a good punt. Who is it? It's Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. Ooh, yeah. I know a little bit about Fatty Arbuckle because his whole career was ruined by an unprovable allegation against him. But I won't say any more than that in case it's his story. <laughs> okay, so let's let's get into Fatty Arbuckle. Before we get into our story, I just want to take a moment to talk to you about the Cosplay Journal a new coffee table magazine by friend of the show Holly Rose, focusing on the diversity and craft of cosplay. The Cosplay Journal is out now, and I've read the first issue. It's a great read, full of informative articles and beautiful photographs. I'm a geek myself, but I'm not a cosplayer, yet I still found a lot in this magazine to give me a deeper look into this part of geek culture. The book has craft-focused articles on sewing, armour building and makeup, as well as some interviews with some incredible cosplayers, some professional, some simply being the perfectionist amateur. They ask, are cosplay guests worth it in their opinion piece article, and have a handy guide for cosplayers on how to survive a con, which is advice worth reading even if you're not a cosplayer. The Cosplay Journal is available now. You can find it on Amazon for just $9.99, so make sure you pick up your copy today so that you don't miss out. Roscoe Conklin Fatty Arbuckle was born on March 24th, 1887, in Smith Centre, Kansas, one of nine children of Mary Gordon and William Arbuckle. Roscoe weighed in excess of 13 pounds at birth, and as both his parents were slim, his father believed that Roscoe was in fact not his son. Sounds appropriate. (laughs) The baby's fat. You've had an affair. Mm. (laughs) I like his reasoning, not... William proposed to name the baby after a politician and notorious womanizer that he hated, Republican Senator Roscoe Conklin. The birth was traumatic for Molly, 
giving birth to a 13 pound baby resulted in chronic health problems that eventually contributed to her death 12 years later. Is that chronic uh, health problem an iffy snatch? <laughs> I think the chronic health problem is he shattered her bones coming out. She's got no hips and pelvis anymore. Okay. Because 13 pounds, that is huge. Well, it is, but it's not exactly like rare. It does happen. Yeah, but if you're going to squeeze a person out of your genitals, you'd rather they not be 13 pounds. Well, I've decided <laughs> not to squeeze a person out of my genitals. That's been, that's been my stance on it. It's a good stance. I, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Brave, in my opinion, but, you know, not to beat myself up. <laughs> When Roscoe was two, his family moved to Santa Ana, California. He was described as having a wonderful singing voice and was extremely agile despite his large build. When he was eight, his mother encouraged him to perform on stage. And when renowned character actor and playwright Frank Bacon's company made a stopover in Santa Ana, Roscoe performed with them, making his stage debut. Roscoe enjoyed performing and continued on until his mother's death in 1899 when he was 12. Hang on a minute, he carried on till his mother's death. Does that mean he just went, fuck that, that was my muse? Well, something happens next that kind of interferes with his stage career. Okay, if it doesn't involve a Coke bottle, I've misread this story. His father, who had always treated him harshly, now refused to support him financially, still believing him to be another man's son and blaming him in part for Molly's death. Without the support of his father, Roscoe had to get a job doing odd jobs in a hotel in order to survive. Roscoe was in the habit of singing while he worked, and was overheard by a customer who was a professional singer. The customer invited him to perform in an amateur talent show. The show consisted of the audience judging acts by clapping or jeering, with bad acts being pulled off stage by a shepherd's crook. Okay. Yeah, I, I had no idea that actually happened. I thought it was I, I just made that, up. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was just in like, well, not literally carry on films, but that kind of humour. Yeah, but no, it turns out people actually did it. Okay. Roscoe sang, danced and did some clowning around, but did not impress the audience. When he saw the crook emerge from the wings to pull him off stage, he somersaulted into the orchestra pit in order to avoid Somersaulted? It. Yet he did a forward somersault off the stage. All right, this is a bit school of rock so far. <laughs> the audience went wild, and he not only won the competition, but began a career in vaudeville. In 1904, showman Sid Gorman invited Roscoe to sing in his, un in his new unique theatre in San Francisco. Hang on a minute, what made him think that guy could sing? Have we got into that at all? Um, it just says that he had a nice singing voice as a child. I don't okay, know, maybe... It was passable singing. He he went on to do silent movies, so I guess we don't know for certain if he s could sing or not because but there are no recordings. Yeah. <laughs> he later joined the <clears throat> he later joined the Pantages Theatre Company, touring the west coast of the United States, and in 1906 played the Orpheum Theatre in Portland in a vaudeville troupe organised by Leon Errol. Roscoe became the main act, and the group took their show on tour. In sorry, on August sixth, nineteen oh eight, Arbuckle married Minta Dufree, the daughter of Charles Warren. Minta. Dufresne. Yep. That's a bit close to Munter, isn't it? <laughs> it's like she's ugly. It's all right. Uh, he married ironically, a Munter. She's she's quite pretty. <laughs> all right. Dufree would go on to star in many early comedy films, often alongside Roscoe. They were described as being make. They were described as making a strange couple, as Minta was short and petite, while Roscoe tipped the scales at £300. Roscoe then joined the Morosco Burbank Stock Vaudeville Company and went on a tour of China and Japan, returning in early 1909. He began his film career with the Selig Polyscope Company in July 1909, when he appeared in Ben Kidd's. Roscoe appeared sporadically in Selig One Reelers until 1913, moved briefly to Universal Pictures, and became a star in, in producer-director Mark Sennett Keystone's corpse comedies. However, according to the Motion Picture Studio Directory for 1919 and 1921, Roscoe began his screen career with Keystone in 1913 as an extra for $3 a day, 
equivalent to $74 by today's standards. He eventually worked his way up through the acting ranks and became a lead player and director. Although his size was undoubtedly part of his comedic appeal, Roscoe was self-conscious about his weight and refused to use it to get cheap laughs. For example, he would not allow himself to be stuck in doorways or to get stuck in chairs. Roscoe was a talented singer, and after famed operatic tenor Enrico Caruso heard him sing, he urged the comedian to give up this nonsense you do for a living. With training, you could become the second greatest singer in the world. Enrico Caruso sounds a bit too much like Enrico Palazzo from the Naked Gun films. So I'm just <laughs> I'm just picturing him taking advice from Leslie Nielsen at this point. <laughs> I also like the fact that he tells him he could be the second greatest singer in the world because he holds himself in much higher regards. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, you can be almost as good as me. Yeah, <laughs> it's a strange compliment, but I like it. Despite his physical size, Roscoe was remarkably agile and acrobatic. Director Mark Sennett, when recounting his first meeting with Roscoe, noted that he skipped up the stairs as light as Fred Astaire, and without warning went into a feather light step, clapped his hands, and did a backward somersault as grateful as a girl tumbler. Hang on a minute, sorry, say that again. He skipped up the stairs as light as Fred Astaire, without warning went into a feather light step, clapped his hands and did a backward somersault as graceful as a girl tumbler. Who, who described this? Mark Sennett. Okay. All right, Mark, no problem. Roscoe was also fond of the pie-in-the-face gag, a comedy cliché that had come to symbolise the silent film era. The earliest known pie-in-the-face pie gag on film was in the June 1913 Keystone One reeler A Noise from the Deep, which starred Roscoe. When we say pie, when we say pie in the face, we do mean this sort of food stuff and not a euphemism. Yeah, it's the. I was about to say cream pie in the face, but we again. don't mean it. We don't. <laughs> we we don't mean a minge. Um, I hope it's not that version, but I'm assuming it's just the whipped cream pie in the face. Cool. We'd all watch though, wouldn't we? It would make an interesting fatty arbuckle movie. <laughs> Absolutely, we totally watch. In 1914, Paramount Pictures made the then unheard of offer of $1,000 a day plus 25% of all profits and complete artistic control to make movies with Roscoe and Normand. That's, sorry, Mabel Normand. The movies were so lucrative and popular that in 1918 they offered Roscoe a three year, $3 million contract which would come to $49 million today. By 1916, Roscoe was experiencing serious health problems. An infection that developed on his leg became a carbuncle so severe that doctors considered amputation. Although he was able to keep his leg, he actually became addicted to morphine as a result. Drugs? I'm listening. <laughs> Following his recovery... Roscoe started his own film company, Comique. Although Comique produced some of the best short pictures of the silent era, in 1918, Roscoe transferred his controlling interests in the company to Buster Keaton and accepted Paramount's three million offer to make up to 18 feature films over three years. Roscoe disliked his screen name, Fatty Arbuckle. Fatty had been Roscoe's nickname since school. It was inevitable, he said. He weighed 185 pounds or 13 stone when he was 12. Fans also called Roscoe the Prince of Wales, as in the animal, and the Balloonatic. Yeah, so, kids aren't very witty, are they? Yeah. That's Although, true. I kind of like the Balloonatic. It sounds like a comic book villain. Yeah, but the Wales one shit. Yeah, that one's pretty crap. The name Fatty identified the character that Roscoe played on screen not Roscoe himself. When Roscoe portrayed a female, the character was named Miss Fatty. Roscoe discouraged anyone from addressing him as Fatty off-screen, and when they did so, his usual response was, I've got a name, you know. That's not very witty at all. He does have a name, but you're famous for being this. Sorry. <laughs> it's like, if it happens that much that you've become well-known for that response, you'd think you could come up with something better. Or change career frankly. Yeah. If you feel that badly about it. I mean, I, I did feel a bit sorry for him. I really do, because like, I've heard some horrible stuff about this guy. But it's like, well, 
if you're not happy, do something else. Mm. Don't just don't make don't become famous being Fatty Arbuckle, and then after you're famous, go don't call me Fatty. That's mental. Yeah, and you you'd have to think he had some say in his screen name. So yeah, he could have called himself like Toned and Fit Arbuckle, <laughs> Muscular Arbuckle, or just Roscoe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there was no need for the nickname, really. Roscoe Actually, Arbuckle. Didn't even occur to me. Go just go by your name, Roscoe Arbor. Cool. Yeah. You're a physical comedian. Awesome. On September 5th, 1921, Roscoe took a break from his hectic film schedule, and despite suffering from second degree burns to both buttocks from an accident on set, drove to San Francisco with two friends, Lowell Sherman and Fred Fishbank. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. He stopped. Hang on. He. <laughs> Had an accident with his buttocks. Yes. Move on. We've, we've missed some details there, haven't we? Well, I was looking into this because I found two different accounts of what happened. One was that he was filming a movie and basically his ass got set on fire by accident. Which, considering some of the crazy shit they did in the silent movies, I can believe that. Yeah. The other one was that he took his car into a garage to get serviced, sat down on a workman's bench where there was a rag soaked in acid, and the acid burnt his butt cheeks. Right. Which I find a little bit harder to believe. But either way, yeah, he got serious burns on his ass. All right, whatever works for him. <laughs> okay, so he's travelled to San Francisco with... Low Sherman and Fred Fishback. The three checked into three rooms at the St. Francis Hotel. Room 1219 for Roscoe and Fishback to share, 1221 for Sherman, and 1220, which they designated as the party room. Several women were invited to the suite. During the partying, a 26-year-old aspiring actress named Virginia Rapp was found seriously ill in room 219, and was examined by the hotel doctor, who concluded that her symptoms were mostly caused by drunkenness and gave her morphine to calm her down. Rapp was hospitalised two days after the incident. I've got a picture here, which is the party room after their big party. For anyone listening, um, she's just shared this picture of a room that's post-party, but it looks like post-riot. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, so basically, <laughs> apart from the fact there's clearly a mattress there, that could be a street somewhere after a riot. <laughs> Pretty bad. Yeah, and this is times where prohibition was in effect, so they they really must have got a lot of bootleg alcohol to do this amount of damage. I yeah. can't imagine how much it cost them to both. Buy the booze and then pay off. Well, that's the, the thing with Fatty Arbor. I don't want to cast aspersions on the guy because I don't know enough about him to be absolutely sure what happened. But you look at it and you go, well, like, he was a bit of a party boy. Mm. Yeah. After seeing the room, you can believe that when him and his two mates went to party, they went to really party. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, two days after the party, Rap has been hospitalised. She had suffered from chronic cystitis, a condition that liquor irritated dramatically. Now, for anyone listening, if you're not sure what that means, um, to put it in layman's terms, she had an iffy snatch. Yeah, it's a UTI, so yeah, it burns when she pees. Burns when she pees, yeah. Her heavy drinking and the poor quality of the era's bootleg alcohol would leave her in severe physical distress. She developed a reputation for overdrinking at parties, then drunkenly tearing her clothes from her body in physical pain. We've all done it. Yeah, who hasn't ripped their clothes off like the Hulk? Yeah. At the hospital, Rapp's companion at the party, Bambina Delmont, told Rapp's doctor that Roscoe had raped her. The doctor examined Rapp but found no evidence of rape. Rapp died one day after her hospitalisation from peritonitis, caused by a ruptured bladder. Following Rapp's death, Delmont told police that Roscoe had raped Rapp. 
the police believe that the impact of Arbuckle's overweight body lying on top of Rapp could have eventually caused her bladder to rupture. At a later press conference, Rapp manager Al Semenecker accused Roscoe of using a piece of ice to stimulate sex with Rapp, thus leading to injuries. However, by the time the story was reported in newspapers, it had changed and the object had evolved into a Coca-Cola or champagne bottle rather than a piece of ice. Which is the famous story. That's the version of the story that he, like, um, yeah. uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Violated her with a Coke bottle. That's the famous mm-hmm. version of the story. Yeah. Witnesses testified that Roscoe rubbed the ice on Rap's stomach to ease her abdominal pain whilst forcing the bottle inside her. Roscoe denied any wrongdoing. Delmont later made a statement incriminating Roscoe to the police in an attempt to extort money from his attorneys. On September 17th, 1921, Roscoe was arrested and arraigned on the charges of manslaughter, but arranged bail after nearly three weeks in jail. The trial was a major media event. William Randolph Hearst's newspaper chain exploited the situation with exaggerated and sensationalised stories. The story was fueled by yellow journalism, with the newspapers portraying Roscoe as a gross lecher who used his weight to overpower innocent girls. Hearst was gratified by the profits he accrued during the trial, and later said that it had sold more newspapers than any event since the sinking of the Lusitania. Because of the stories in the press, morality groups called for Roscoe to be sentenced to death before the trial even began. Before the trial? Yeah, it hadn't even got to trial, and they were already calling for him to get the death penalty. God bless America. Yeah. Power of the press to Mm. completely influence public opinion before any evidence has even been heard. You wouldn't see that happening nowadays. Not at all. No (laughs) fake news bollocks or anything. Oh, God, I hate that. I've always loved America (laughs) and Americans, but in the last year I've come to fucking hate them, and it's not their fault. It's not their fault. It's just totally the idea that, like, uh, anybody trying to report anything is, like, an enemy. Roscoe was regarded by those who knew him closely as a good-natured man who was shy around women. He was described as the most chaste man in pictures. The most chaste. Now, Angela, isn't that absolute? You're either chaste or you're not, aren't you? I mean, if, <laughs> I, if I don't sleep with anyone and you don't sleep with anyone, you're not more chaste than me, are you? I don't know. If you don't sleep with people but you look at porn and I don't sleep with people but don't, would I get that edge over you? Okay. <laughs> Have you been checking out my internet history? Studio executives, fearing negative publicity by association, ordered ordered Roscoe's industry friends and fellow actors, whose careers they controlled, not to publicly speak up for him. Charlie Chaplin, who was in Britain at the time, told reporters that he could not and would not believe Roscoe Arbuckle had anything to do with Virginia Rapp's death, having known Roscoe since they were both worked at Keystone Pictures in 1914. Chaplin said he knew Roscoe to be a genial, easygoing type who would not harm a fly. That's the tragedy of all of this, because nobody ever knows what happened behind closed doors, and so yeah. we cannot exonerate the man, but at the same time, there were flaws in the case, and at the same time, everybody who knew this guy was like, absolutely no way. And yeah. nearly nearly a century on, we're still going, we don't know. And this guy... It, forevermore his his reputation is tied up in this mm. it doesn't mean he wasn't guilty but at the same time it certainly isn't clear and definite yeah and that that's really horrible and and he's famous for it and you know mm. the first time you said tonight we're talking about and i mean this with no crudity at all i promise you but the moment you said tonight we're talking about fatty arbuckle i thought coat bottle yeah. It's like what he is literally most famous for. Um, that's really horrible. Yeah. What I found is like a lot of people have heard of him and just know him as the silent movie guy mm. who had the chain of restaurants named after him here in the UK. But the people who found out about the trial and everything like that, they, yeah, it's like you can't help but think of him with mm. those stories now. And it's it does sour... I mean, it's, it's two or three things. It, I don't even if you don't know the story, and I'm not even sure I did. It's like a few fragmented facts. It's mm. it's something to do with a coke bottle, his weight damaging a woman, and the force of being violating, killing her. 
that those are like the bits of the story I've always known. Mm. And um, it, it's never been clear that he actually did anything. Um, and that's horrible. But I guess we're looking at forensics a century ago. But we'll be going into the trial in a bit more detail. So cool. hopefully um, you can learn a bit more. Like I, I've got an opinion. My, obviously, it, like you said, it's all unproven it could be either thing happened but i i've got an opinion about this myself based on everything that okay. happened during the trial but i'll go into that at the end and sure okay uh, buster keaton reportedly also made one public statement in support of roscoe's innocence a decision which earned him a mild reprimand from the studio uh, film actor william s hart who had never met or worked with roscoe made a number of damaging public statements in which he presumed that Roscoe was guilty. In retaliation for these statements, Roscoe wrote a premise for a film parodying her as a thief, bully, and wife-beater, which Keaton purchased from him. The resulting film, The Frozen North, was released in 1922, almost a year after the scandal first emerged. Keaton co-wrote, directed, and starred in the picture. Consequently, Hart refused to speak to Keaton for many years. I can't blame him for that one. What, well, based on nothing? Yeah. He talks shit about you, so it's like, okay, here's a film where you're an arsehole. It's fair enough, really. Uh, absolutely, yeah. I, I, <laughs> yeah, based on a story I wrote with no factual background at all. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. The prosecutor at the trial, San Francisco District Attorney Matthew Brady, an intensely ambitious man who planned to run for governor, made public pronouncements of Roscoe's guilt and pressured witnesses to make false statements. Brady at first used Delmont as his star witness during the indictment hearing. The defence also obtained a letter from Delmont admitting a plan to extort money from Roscoe. In view of Delmont's constantly changing story, her testimony would have ended any chance of going to trial. Ultimately, the judge found no evidence of rape, but after hearing testimony from one of the party guests, Zay Pravon, that Rapp had told her Roscoe hurt me on her deathbed, the judge decided that Roscoe could be charged with first-degree murder. Brady had originally planned to seek the death penalty, but the charge was later reduced to manslaughter. The trial began on November 14, 1921, in the city courthouse in San Francisco. Roscoe's defence lawyer was Gavin McNabb, a professional and competent local attorney that Roscoe hired as his lead defence counsel. The principal witness was Miss Zay Pravon, a guest at the party. At the beginning of the trial, Roscoe told his already estranged wife, Minta Dufree, that he did not harm Rap. She believed him and appeared regularly in the courtroom to support him. However, public feeling was so negative towards Roscoe that she was later shot at whilst entering the courthouse. Brady's first witness during the trial included Betty Campbell, a model who attended the party, and testified that she saw Roscoe with a smile on his face hours after the alleged rape occurred. Grace Holston, a local hospital nurse who testified it was very likely that Roscoe raped Rapp and bruised her body in the process, and Dr. Edward Heinrich, a local criminologist who claimed that the fingerprints on the door to the hallway proved that Rapp had tried to flee, but Roscoe had stopped her by putting his hand over hers. Based on... Uh, hang on a minute. Based on fingerprints on the doorknob that doesn't sound plausible yeah yeah the the evidence is quite shaky already and honestly already, it's yeah, only absolutely. gonna get shakier absolutely okay dr arthur beardsley the hotel doctor who examined rap testified that an external force seemed to have damaged the bladder during cross-examination however betty campbell revealed that brady had threatened to charge her with perjury if she did not testify against Roscoe. Dr. Heinrich's claim to have found fingerprints was cast into doubt after McNabb produced the St. Francis Hotel maid, who testified that she had thoroughly cleaned the room before the investigation took place. Dr. Beardsley admitted that Rapp had never mentioned being assaulted while he was treating her. This is the kind of thing I've heard about this case that, like, uh, nobody ever knows for certain, but it was always totally that at every turn it just didn't sound right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So far, it it's literally just people saying it happened with no physical evidence to support it. Yeah. Okay. 
McNabb was further able to get Nurse Holston to admit that the rupture of Rapp's bladder could very well have been a, as a result of cancer, and that the bruises on her body could also have been from a result of the heavy jewellery she was wearing that evening. During the defence stage of the trial, McNabb called various pathology experts who testified that although Rapp's bladder was ruptured, there was evidence of chronic inflammation and no evidence of any pathological changes producing the rupture. In other words, there was no external cause for it. On November 28th, Roscoe testified at the defence's final witness. Roscoe was simple, direct and unflustered in both direct and cross-examination. In his testimony, Roscoe claimed that Rapp, who he testified he had known for five or six years, came into the party room around noon that day, and that sometime afterwards, May Torb, daughter-in-law of Billy Sunday, asked him for a ride into town. So he went to his room to change his clothes, where he discovered Rapp in the bathroom vomiting into the toilet. Roscoe then claimed Rapp told him she fell ill and asked to lie down. He carried her into the bedroom and asked a few of the party guests to help treat her. When Roscoe and a few of the guests re-entered the room, they found Rapp on the floor near the bed, tearing at her clothing and going into violent convulsions. To calm Rapp down, they placed her in a bathtub of cool water. Roscoe and Fishback then took her to room 21227 and called the hotel manager and doctor. At this point, all those present thought Rapp was just very drunk, including the hotel doctor. Roscoe then left the hotel, driving Torb into town. During the whole trial, the prosecution presented medical description of Rapp's bladder as evidence that she had an illness. In his testimony, Roscoe denied that he had any knowledge of Rapp's illness. But during cross-examination, Assistant District Attorney Leo Friedman aggressively grilled Roscoe over the fact that he refused to call a doctor when he found Rapp sick, and argued that he refused to do so because he knew of Rapp's illness and saw it as an opportunity to rape and kill her. <sighs> he saw an illness. As, no, I, I don't get that. I've never got anything. I, most of the details you're telling me tonight, I, I didn't actually know. But I've heard bits and pieces over the years where you go, no, that literally makes no sense. Yeah. The woman was ill, and he didn't report it because he wanted to kill her. None of that makes sense as an argument at all. Mm-hmm. Okay. It seems to me that they are just trying to find any way of justifying him being guilty. Yeah. And yeah. so they're coming up with bollocks, really, from the sounds yeah. of it. Okay. Roscoe calmly maintained that he never physically hurt or sexually assaulted Rap in any way during the party. And he also claimed that he never made any inappropriate sexual advances against any woman in his life. After over two weeks of testimony with 60 prosecution and defence witnesses, including 18 doctors who testified about Rapp's illness, the defence rested. On December 4th, 1921, the jury returned five days later, deadlocked after nearly 44 hours of deliberation, with a 10-2 to not guilty verdict, and a mistrial was declared. Which is the worst possible result, because... Um... A mistrial is not exonerated. You know what I mean? No. Mm. no. It, it means he's going to have to go through this all yeah, over again. You, I, I think the average member of the public would assume, not guilty necessarily, but they would assume halted because of um, effectively technical reasons. Mm. Yeah. Roscoe's attorneys later con concentrated their attention on one woman named Helen Hubbard, who had told jurors that she would vote guilty until hell freezes over. She refused to look at the exhibits or read the trial transcripts, having made up her mind in the courtroom. Right. On January 11th, 1922, a second trial began, with a new jury, but the same legal defence and prosecution, as well as the same presiding judge. The same evidence was presented, but this time one of the witnesses, Zay Prevon, testified that Brady had forced her to lie. Another witness... Sorry, were you about to say something? I was about to say, forced her to lie, this is one of the prosecution witnesses, yeah? Yeah. So she's saying the prosecutor told her to lie that yeah, in the this story. Is, this is everything I've ever heard. Uh, you know, we're here to like <laughs> uh, hear these things and like have some fun and stuff. And I'm not being that funny. And the fact is that I, I don't know for certain that Fatty Arbuckle was innocent. But everything I've ever heard about this case is being reflected tonight. And what I mean by that is... 
I've forgotten most of it. So a lot of what you're saying to me is is almost effectively new to me. Mm. And it isn't about whether he's innocent or not. It, it's almost like there was this pre-assumption he was. Yeah. And it was almost like he's a fat guy, we'll, we'll hang it on him. It was just horrible. And I, I'd forgotten these details, but I do remember this guy was absolutely ruined for something he was never, ever convicted of. But... Um, I didn't know that detail. I didn't know that there was evidence that like he, uh, prosecution witnesses were being pushed mm. to say certain things. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things, you hear that and you think, well, can you trust anything the prosecution says at that point, really? Well, no, that, that should almost be a mistrial, but yeah. it's obviously not how it worked. Another witness who testified during the first trial a former security guard named Jesse Norgard, who worked at Culver Studios where Roscoe worked, testified that Roscoe had once shown up at the studio and offered him a cash bribe in exchange for the key to Rapp's dressing room. He supposedly said he wanted to play a joke on her. Norgard said that he refused to give him the key, but during cross-examination, Norgard's testimony was called into question when he was revealed to be an ex-convict who was currently charged with sexually assaulting an eight-year-old girl and was looking for a sentence reduction from the prosecution in exchange for his testimony. Okay. Further, in contrast to the first trial, Rapp's history of promiscuity and heavy drinking was detailed. The second trial also discredited some major evidence, such as the identification of Roscoe's fingerprints on the hotel room door. Heinrich took back his earlier testimony from the first trial and testified that the fingerprint evidence was likely faked. The defense was also convinced of an acquittal. Sorry, the defense was so convinced of an acquittal that Roscoe was not called to testify. See, you know, lazy uh, testimony I get, and lazily we want a conviction I get. When we start talking about them faking evidence, mm -hmm. do we have any knowledge that there was some kind of vendetta against Fatty Arbuckle? That you know of, you may not. I'm just saying, have you ever not, heard of anything like that? Not that I found in my research, but it does. There was a lot of people who didn't like Hollywood at the time. They saw film stars as people who drank, did drugs, slept around. They and, would think of it as ruin, any new technology is ruining the more moral fortitude of kids, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And this is their chance to make an example of the whole of Hollywood and how it's evil and corrupt with Roscoe Arbuckle. It's what it seems to be from things I've found, like a lot of the newspaper articles at the time were very much like, he is evil, just like other actors. You know, this kind of thing happens in Hollywood all the time. It's corrupt. It's depraved kind of journalism. Yeah. I'm ha I was happier when Canadians wanted to kill me. <laughs> uh, I, I'm now listening to somebody who was probably innocent, totally ruined. Yeah. Yeah, this is horrible. Roscoe's lawyer, McNabb, made no closing argument to the jury. However, some jurors interpreted the refusal to let Roscoe testify as a sign of guilt. After five days and over 40 hours of deliberation, the jury returned on February 3rd, deadlocked with a 9-3 to guilty verdict, resulting in a second mistrial. Right. Now, I've, I've, I've always been tempted to say mistrial should be it, and then I'm reminded Bill Cosby's first case was a mistrial, and then you go, yeah. oh no, I'm not, I'm not comfortable <laughs> saying that, you know what I mean? Yeah, that... You get the general principle, and the general principle yeah. would be innocent people... Uh, sorry. <clears throat> the general principle of what I've just said <clears throat> would mean occasionally guilty people get off. It just would. Mm. But you get what I'm saying, that like, if there's continually mistrials, why would you keep putting people through it? Yeah. But I'm pulled up by the fact that, like, oh, no, Bill Cosby, you know? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult one because you put yourself in the shoes of someone who is innocent and having to go through trial would be horrific, but then mistrial after mistrial, it's like it would... And, 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 and like, never Tommy Robinson, like Tommy Robinson, sometimes it is purely procedural. Yeah. And then you go, well, like, it doesn't mean there isn't. It just means they didn't follow a certain procedure. Yeah. Um, it's really difficult. It, it really, really is. But 
at the same time, if what I said holy true, it held true, um, Bill Cosby would have got off because there was a mistrial first time. So it's really, really difficult. But at the same time, you just go, you just cannot keep pe- putting people through trials where there's majority verdicts. But yeah. By the time of his third trial, Roscoe's films had been banned and newspapers had been filled for the past seven months with stories of alleged Hollywood orgies, murder and sexual perversion. You have me at orgies. <laughs> Delmont was touring the country giving one-woman shows as the woman who signed the murder charge against Arbuckle and lecturing on the evils of Hollywood. The third trial began on March 13th, 1922, and this time the defence took no chances. McNabb took an aggressive defence, completely tearing apart the prosecution's case with long and aggressive examinations and cross-examinations of each witness. McNabb also managed to get in some more evidence about Virginia Rapp's lurid past and medical history. Another hole in the prosecution's case was opened because Zay Pravon, the key witness, was out of the country after fleeing police custody and was unable to testify. As in the first trial, Roscoe testified as the final witness and again maintained his denial in his heartfelt testimony about his version of events. During closing statements, McNabb reviewed how flawed the case was against Roscoe from the very start, and how District Attorney Brady fell for the outlandish charges of Maud Delmont, who McNabb described as the complaining witness who never witnessed. The jury began deliberations on April 12th and took only six minutes to return with a unanimous not guilty verdict. Six minutes, it took him two and a half minutes to get to the room and sit down, and a minute is to get back. <laughs> and you've got to go around the table and ask individually 12 mm-hmm. people what they think. Six minutes is literally nothing. Well, apparently, five of those minutes were spent writing a formal statement of apology to Roscoe for putting him through the ordeal. The jury statement, as read by the jury foreman, said, Acquittal is not enough for Roscoe Arbuckle. We feel that a great injustice has been done him. We feel also that it is only our plain duty to give him this exoneration under the evidence, for there was not the slightest proof adduced to connect him in any way to the commission of a crime. He was manly throughout the trial and told a straightforward story on the witness stand, which we all believed. The happening at the hotel was an unfortunate affair for which Arbuckle so the evidence shows, was in no way responsible. We wish him success and hope that the American people will take judgment of 14 men and women who have sat listening for 31 days to evidence that Roscoe Arbuckle is entirely innocent and free from all blame. He kind of got charged because he was overweight. Yeah. And I'm not saying there was a vendetta against him for that, but that's literally what happened. Something happened and they went, that is consistent with what a fat bloke might do. Yeah, her um, bladder ruptured. Yeah. Well, a heavy guy could do that. Let's arrest him, was yeah. basically... Yeah. After the reading of the apology statement, the jury foreman personally handed it to Roscoe, who would keep it as a treasured memento for the rest of his life. Then, one by one, the entire 12-person jury, plus the two jury alternates, walked up to Roscoe's defence table, where they shook his hand and or embraced him and personally apologised to him. The Which entire... is literally as far as you can go uh, to say this should never have happened. Yeah. Because obviously most times it, it's an acquittal and that's it. That is the jury going out of their way to say this was an embarrassment. Yeah. It makes a really clear point of mm. they in no way think there's any any hint of guilt. And this guy is a victim here. Yeah. And they even proudly posed in a photo with Roscoe for photographers after the verdict and apology. Yeah. Some experts later concluded that Rapp's bladder might have also ruptured as a result of an abortion that she had a short time before the party. Unfortunately, Rapp's organs had been destroyed and it was impossible for tests for pregnancy to be conducted. Because alcohol was consumed at the party, Roscoe was forced to plead guilty to one count of violating the Volstead Act and had to pay a $500 fine. The Volstead Act, do we know what that is? That's Prohibition. Sorry, what year are we talking about? I I thought Prohibition was later than that. Uh, This is 1922. Um, 
I thought Pearl Vision was late 20s to late 30s, but I've obviously got that wrong. Uh, let me just have a look. It came into effect between October ago. 1919 and January 1920. Yeah, and it lasted about 12 years. No, that's right. Okay, fair enough. They were actually, uh, they were actually uh, constitutional amendments. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, fair enough. At the time of his acquittal, Roscoe owed over $700,000, the equivalent of $10.2 million in legal fees to his attorneys for the three criminal trials. And he was forced to sell his home and all of his cars to pay some of the debt. The scandal and trials had greatly damaged his popularity among the general public, and in spite of his acquittal and the apology, his reputation was not restored, and the effects of the scandal continued. William H. Hayes, who served as the head of the newly formed Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America, Hollywood Censor Board, cited Roscoe as an example of the poor morals in Hollywood. Yeah. On April 18th, 1922, six days after Roscoe's acquittal, Hayes banned Roscoe from ever working in US movies again. He also requested that all showings and bookings of his films be cancelled and exhibitors complied. You know, we're talking about Something that's like 90 years ago. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm always staying quiet because I'm still furious. I've yeah. known about this case for a while. You're telling me lots of things tonight I didn't know, genuinely. But like, I've always known that like this guy was like denoted as innocent and ruined nonetheless. Mm. And I, I've got no complaints. And I, I don't want to make this too political because I'm not in the position of people that have been mistreated. So when we look at things like Me Too and all the rest of it, I really just don't want to say anything. But I'm I'm still concerned that like we'll head down the same path that somebody will be ruined, and it turns out they didn't do anything, mm-hmm. and we've learnt nothing in a hundred years. Yeah, it's like you can't ignore claims of those kind of abuses and stuff but at the same time you it, it's really difficult because the, the the general um the the general perspective is believe women and i don't want to argue with that because why would you not but at the same time it doesn't mean in every case it's absolutely true and this idea of trial without any kind of jury we, we've had it recently with chris hardwick mm. from like the nerdist and stuff and and I don't know what the truth is with that guy, but all I know is that somebody spoke out against him, and after an investigation by, like, the network he worked for, they've now reinstated him. And I'm sat there thinking, well, it doesn't mean it's, he's innocent, and, and I don't know what to say. But at the same time, they've gone and found out more than I know, and they've reinstated him. Mm. So it's really difficult that we end up, like, judging people without any sort of due process. But it, it's just difficult. I don't want to. I don't want to disbelieve anyone. I don't want to mistrust yeah. anyone. And when people talk about horrible experiences they go through, I just want. To, I want to respond with sympathy. I, I do, but it's just difficult that like we have this precedent from like a hundred years ago, nearly that like it isn't always true. It, yeah. it it just isn't. And I don't know what you do with that. I really don't because it's, it is an impossible situation. You have to, you have to believe that these people making these accusations are coming from a place of honesty and that they're not just making things up. But at the same time, you also have to believe that someone is innocent until the evidence finds but isn't, them not guilty. Isn't, isn't and you can't difficulty. do both. And exactly because isn't the difficulty that well, like if that was true, you wouldn't need a trial. If if somebody said. I'd rate them, and the um, general perception is believe women, mm. then you don't need a trial, because they said. And it's really difficult, because trials aren't absolutely um, foolproof either. No. People get, you know, you're talking about reasonable doubt, which is a difficult bar. So I, I, I'm not trying, I, I certainly wouldn't, I don't ever want to go down the path of, well, they said, but what does that mean? I really don't. I, I genuinely, as a straight heterosexual cis male, don't know what to make of this because I, I genuinely want to believe people at their word. But at the same time, lots of people have gone up to trial for rape and been found innocent. So yeah. what do you do with that? 
I really don't know what to make of it. And and Fatty Arbuckle is always kind of a um, a precedent in my mind because he, he was ruined for something that he almost certainly didn't do. And I, I don't know what to make of that. I really, really don't. And it's difficult now because women are brave enough to speak out sometimes against people. Mm. And you, your heart goes out to them, but then you think, well... That isn't always honest. People do lie. And I, I, I'm, I don't think it's a resolvable tension. I don't think it's something that like you could say to me tonight, well, you just think of it that way, and that will be the end of it. I just think it's like an irresolvable tension that you just look at it and go, well, I, I want to believe women. You should believe women. But at the same time, people get accused of things, and it ain't always so. Yeah. It's really difficult. It just is. Mm. That there is no easy answer or solution, no. and I'm so glad I don't work in the legal field. <laughs> no, it, oh, yeah, but yeah, it, it it's just hard not to find it difficult because you, you know, a, as a man, and we are normally seen as not the enemy. I don't mean to be childish about it, but we're normally seen as like you must understand. There's so much you don't get, mm. and. Trying to understand that as somebody who has never had any confusion over my sexuality or my gender and the way society views it, I don't mean this the wrong way, particularly talking to you, but you know what I mean. Society would judge me as like the right answer in that like I'm straight and I believe I'm in the body I'm meant to be in. Yeah. Mm. So it's really easy for me to like comment on anything. And I always try to understand that, like, I, I don't get it. I don't get any of this. I, I never, I never, I didn't hit puberty and suddenly realized that my sexuality was quote unquote, the wrong answer. I never, I never looked at myself and thought I'm the wrong gender. I never had any of that. And there's people out there, like, if you don't mind me saying, yourself, who went through that. Mm -hmm. And I am trying so hard to understand that. And wrapped up in all of that, and it's a completely different issue, Amy, but it is wrapped up in the same thing, is believe women. And you want to. But at the same time, if my best friend in the world was accused of rape, I'd be sceptical for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. And you just look at it and you go, I, I actually wonder sometimes if i'm just getting old i just look at it and just think i actually don't know what my stance should be on anything you know because and fatty arbuckle was just a wonderful example that like <laughs> by any metric you should believe the like almost the charges against him but a hundred years on this guy was ruined by something that was clearly fallacious yeah and I find that really difficult now. I, I find that difficult in today's society that I want to believe what people tell me and, and what I, wa I want to... Everybody wants to, like, be... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not current, but kind of, like, on the right side of history. Yeah. So when you look at something... I mean, if, if you think about, like, um, um, transgender issues, for example, you go back 20 years... And, like, it wasn't a public debate at all. And in the last 10 years, in the consciousness of people who aren't struggling with that sort of thing, we, like, have to catch up. We're suddenly like, okay, um, what we thought wasn't right, we now to need to think a different way. And it's such a movable target, we don't know what to think. And I don't mean transgender issues, I mean anything. I just mean that, like, it's really difficult because the, on the one hand, you've got believe women, which I think is absolutely right. On the other hand, you've got uh, innocent and pro until proven guilty. Yeah. It's really difficult. It's really difficult. And the problem is I am literally the last gender and sexuality that has almost a right to comment here. And it does make it difficult because sometimes you just want to say, can somebody help me? Can somebody actually help me understand how I'm supposed to look at this? 
Unfortunately, after this point in the episode, we don't have Dave with us anymore. But because the story of Roscoe Artbuckle is not finished, I don't want you guys to miss out. So here is the rest of the story for you. In December of the same year, under public pressure, Will Hayes elected to lift the ban. However, Roscoe was still unable to secure work as an actor. Most exhibitors still declined to show Roscoe's films, several of which now have no copies known to have survived intact. One of Roscoe's feature-length films known to survive is Leap Year, which Paramount declined to release in the United States due to the scandal. It was eventually released in Europe. With Roscoe's films now banned, in March 1922, Buster Keaton signed an agreement to give Roscoe 35% of all future profits from his company, Buster Keaton Productions, to ease his financial situation. After the trials, Hollywood shunned Roscoe, and he could no longer find work. A secondary effect for archive history was the determined destruction of copies of his films. In November 1923, Minter de Free filed for divorce, charging grounds of desertion. The divorce was granted the following January. They had been separated since 1921, though de Free always claimed that he was the nicest man in the world and they were still friends. After a brief reconciliation, de Free again filed for divorce, this time while in Paris in December 1924. On May 16th, 1925, Roscoe married Doris Dean. Roscoe tried returning to filmmaking, but industry resistance to distributing his pictures continued to linger long after his acquittal. He retreated into alcoholism. In the words of his first wife, Roscoe only seemed to find solace and comfort in a bottle. Buster Keaton attempted to help Roscoe by giving him work on his films. Roscoe wrote the story for a Keaton short called Daydreams in 1922. Roscoe allegedly also co-directed scenes in Keaton's Sherlock Jr. in 1924, but it's unclear how much of this footage remains in the film's final cut. In 1925, Carter to Haven made the short Character Studies. Roscoe appeared alongside Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd, Rudolph Valentino, Douglas Fairbanks, and Jackie Coogan. That same year, in Photoplay's August issue, James R. Quick wrote... I would like to see Roscoe Arbuckle make a comeback to the screen. The American nation prides itself upon the spirit of fair play. We like the whole world to look upon America as the place where every man gets a square deal. Are you sure Roscoe Arbuckle is getting one today? I'm not. Eventually, Roscoe worked as a director under the alias William Goodrich. According to author David Yallop in The Day the Laughter Stopped, A biography of Arbuckle with special attention to the scandal and its aftermath, Roscoe's father's full name was William Goodrich Arbuckle. Another tale credited Keaton, an inventive punster, with suggesting that Roscoe become a director under the name Will Be Good. The pun being too obvious, Roscoe adopted the more formal pseudonym William Goodrich. Keaton himself told this story during a recorded interview with Kevin Brownlow in the 1960s. Between 1924 and 1932, Roscoe directed a number of comedy shorts under the pseudonym for Educational Pictures, which featured lesser-known comics of the day. Louise Brooks, who played the ingenue in Windy Ridley Goes Hollywood in 1931, told Kevin Brownlow of her experience working with him. He made no attempt to direct this picture. He just sat in the director's chair like a dead man. He had been very nice and sweetly dead ever since the scandal that ruined his career. But it was such an amazing thing for me to come in and make this broken down picture and to find my director was the great Roscoe Arbuckle. Among the more visible directorial projects under the Goodrich pseudonym was the Eddie Cantor feature Special Delivery in 1927, which was released by Paramount and co-starred William Powell. His highest profile project was The Red Mill, also released in 1927, In 1929, Doris Dean sued for divorce in Los Angeles, charging desertion and cruelty. On the 21st of June 1932, Roscoe married Addie Oakley Dukes McPhail in Erie, Pennsylvania. In 1932, Roscoe signed a contract with Warner Brothers to star under his own name in a series of six two-reel comedies to be filmed at the Vitagraph Studios in Brooklyn. These six short films constitute the only recordings of his voice. Silent film comedian Al St. John, Roscoe's nephew, and actors Lionel Stander and Shemp Howard appeared alongside him. The films were very successful in America, although when Warner Brothers attempted to release the first one, Hey Pop, 
in the United Kingdom, the British Board of Film Censors cited the 10-year-old scandal and refused to grant an exhibition certificate. On June 28, 1933, Roscoe had finished filming the last of the two reelers, four of which had already been released. The next day, he signed a contract with Warner to star in a feature-length film. That night, he went out with friends to celebrate his first wedding anniversary and the new Warner contract. He reportedly said, This is the best day of my life. He suffered a heart attack later that night and died in his sleep, aged 46. Many of Arbuckle's films, including the feature-length Life of the Party, survive only as worn prints with foreign language intertitles. Little or no effort was made to preserve original negatives and prints during Hollywood's first two decades. By the early 21st century, some of Roscoe's short subjects, particularly those co-starring Chaplin or Keaton, have been restored and released on DVD, and even screened theatrically. Arbuckle's early influence on American slapstick comedy is widely recognised. Guests to San Francisco's Westin St. Francis Hotel still asked to see the room where the famous party happened. Management are happy to show visitors the suite as long as it's not occupied. For his contributions to the film industry, Roscoe Arbuckle has a motion picture star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, located at 6701 Hollywood Boulevard. If you enjoyed this episode, you can find Eccentric Earth on many social media platforms. Our Twitter is at eccentric underscore earth. Our Facebook is www.facebook.com forward slash eccentric earth. And we're on Instagram under eccentric earth. If you want to write in with any suggestions for future episodes or to get in contact for any reason, our email address is eccentric earth at outlook.com. You can find the show on all major podcast providers and on YouTube, so please make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And if you enjoyed this show, please leave us a review. Thank you everyone for listening, and we will catch you next time. (laughs) 